I'm Justin Six. This is Tom, Tim Ruswick to my right, and we are both game developers. Uh, he released a game called Philophobia, The Fear of Love, on Steam and on Itch. It's a great game. He's worked on some other games. I haven't released anything. I'm a fake game dev, but yeah, we're just going to talk. I feel like a fake game dev after releasing <laughs> stuff, so <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah, a lot of things make us feel like fake game devs, but we're still here talking as game devs. <laughs> I wonder what it is about human psychology that makes us feel like an imposter. I think, do you think it's more of the social media aspect of like, we're doing it in our bedroom alone and then like pushing it out. People I mean, feel like it's they're so pretending. difficult in the times we're in. Right. Cause I think everyone seems better than they are just cause the way we present ourselves through social media, like we're always, yeah, you're in control self. of how people see you. You, you can, you can, really shave off all the edges of everything that they see. Like a lot of people, when they post their art, they'll post the final versions of the art, but they don't talk about this has been through three weeks of iteration and like they've changed it 60 times and then they thought it was finished, but then they came back to it again and tweaked it over and over. But And, and most people think of art like, oh, well, he sat down and he drew that and that's how it worked. But yeah. And it's not, not like the olden works. days where we only compare our art to the art, other artist in the village, you know? It's like right. our art and then everyone else's art in the entire world all in the same platform all competing for attention all competing to be the best yeah. it's it's intense you know the crazy thing about the internet is you can find whatever you're looking for yeah. and if you've got that insecurity where you're, you're looking for proof that your art's not as good as other people's guess what you're gonna find <laughs> a bunch of proof of that yep you can find whatever you want on the internet hmm. but yeah i love as I was talking about before we started recording, I, I've been really into mindset these like past two weeks, and I've been thinking about that a lot. And you were talking about how you have that kind of like, you resonate with that Eminem vibe, right? The like... The anger. That's a great way to intro. <laughs> yeah, I feel <laughs> Eminem likes, has all these murderous and hor horrific lyrics. I resonate with all of that. <laughs> well, it's, it's not no. like to that extreme, just like he doesn't actually There's... murder people, you know? We don't know that. I mean, I don't <laughs> we only know, know that, what he tells but... us on social media. <laughs> um, no, I think there's something about the anger. I was saying, like in in philophobia, there's uh, there's patience, the demon of anger, which was one of the first uh, demons that I built, and I wanted to get that tattooed. I still want to get it tattooed on my arm. Um, there was something about working on the anger section that I just resonated with, and I feel like it's uh, some kind of thing in my brain where I I don't. I don't, it's not that I don't feel anger, but maybe I just can't express it properly. Maybe I was never mm. able to. Like, and I, so I don't a lot get, of my, like, the angry vibe from you. That's why it's, it's actually a little bit surprising. Like, I, you don't well, no, I actually often, think do you? Deficit. No, 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 no. That's what I'm saying is I, I feel like there is a imbalance in, this is going to get some philosophical <laughs> shit here. Okay. I feel like there's an imbalance in my psychology away from anger yeah and that's why i like the really angry shit you know like yeah. the punisher the venom the the eminem the the even the the section in philophobia the anger section it's like i i almost have suppressed that so much that like i feel it and i think that's one of the reasons why i pour it into my art so much is like it doesn't come off as fuck the world kind of angry um but i have always resonated to that stuff and a lot of like my self-improvement and mindset stuff that we're talking about has mm -hmm. come from recognizing that deficit i used to think it was an advantage right i don't feel yeah. angry it's great and it's you know i'm better than all these people that have yeah. feel anger too much but no it's like that's actually an important part of the human experience too and i've suppressed that in yeah, a way every emotion and, has a use right and when you repress right. one it it doesn't just go away <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah anger has a lot of power right like it can get you through things it can make you do things you wouldn't have otherwise have done it can yeah it there's, can there's an emotion scale that i follow where anger is basically the next step up from apathy because anger is great at getting people to take action so if you're in apathy and don't want right. to do anything getting angry is actually wonderful because that'll get you right. off your ass doing something <laughs> apathy is fucking terrifying and we're we're in a state of Especially with the whole pandemic, man, like a yeah. lot of people are in apathy. They they just they're in this constant state of just okay, 
I'm okay yeah. with this. It's complacency. And especially if you're going to be a creative, uh, it takes a lot of self-motivation to get going. But then if you want to be a creative entrepreneur, mm-hmm. right, you want to actually make stuff and then make money off of it. That is a whole lot of work. And nobody is going to sit over your shoulder and say, you got to get this done. You got to get this done. Right. Our lives mm-hmm. don't come with producers built in. You got to be your own producer. And uh, I think I think it's one of the reasons why I've struggled with finishing, too. I think it could be related. Uh, yeah, but finishing I, I've had a problem. mindset shift this week where I realized that I'm envisioning and like subconsciously, just naturally thoughts are popping up in my head of th- and where I'm assuming that things are not going to work out. Like I'm right. assuming that, oh, the game I'm working on, for example, Alien Life Simulator, that it's not going to be successful, that people won't like it, that it's not going to be a good game. And that those beliefs that those automatic thoughts in of themselves push me to failure, you know, they push me to not yeah. succeed because when you visualize that you're naturally going to be moving towards that, you know? Yeah. It's the outcome you're focusing on. It's like your brain is like a Google search box, right? Like it's yeah. going to give you whatever you're actively looking for. Yep. Um, I remember I was afraid of the dark until I was like early twenties because like I would just constantly focus. I'd watch all these scary shit before bed, all these fucking haunted shows, all this stuff. And it's like, that's what I was filling my brain with is like all yeah. this, like there's demons and there's ghosts and there's all this stuff trying to get me. Yeah. Uh, then right you'll before see I go the to demons sleep. and ghosts, you know, if, exactly. if you and there's then demons you think- and ghosts, you're going to see some demons and ghosts. And when you see a shadow, it's not a shadow from a tree. That's a fucking demon that you're yep. seeing, right? <laughs> like it's, you're, you're just, you're the focusing is so on it. powerful. And if, and we have to take control of it or it's going to go on a roller coaster. Yeah. Yeah, I think the same exact thing happens with uh, with negative outcomes and with with, you know, whether you want uh, this certain type of job or whether you think you can go far. That self-confidence is really, really important because like if I've done it, too, I focused on like the wrong things. I'm like, what if it what if it goes wrong? I, I saw a Twitter post one day that was like, you keep asking what if it goes wrong, but what if it goes right? Yeah. And like I actually adapted that as like a an alternate question that I asked myself, like, okay, what are the problems with it? Because there's 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 advantage in looking at a project and say, okay, what if it goes wrong? Sure, right? yeah. There's it's valuable in some ways. If but you want to be critical and kind of see where right you don't what things I you think don't where it do. gets tricky. Like if that's your job on a team to ask what if it goes wrong, mm-hmm. that's going to make you an effective member of the, of the group. But when it's just you like trying to make stuff and like that's yeah. your mindset all the time you're only focusing on one section of a massive like uh, pool of probability. And also like, if you think about it too, there's really no wrong or right. There's just kind of different, right? Yeah. Like if you have to know what the outcome you want to even, to even understand a failure state. And a lot of people don't even do that. Yeah. Right? I want to make a successful game. So important. What does that mean? <laughs> what is that a dollar value? Is that finishing? Is that uh, reviews? Is that stuff you can control? Is it stuff you can't control? Like Yeah. Like I have very know. specific sales numbers that I want to achieve with my game. I have very specific revenue numbers I want to achieve with my game. Like there's very That's specific good. milestones that I want. Um, I, and so I, I'm from, I've been familiar with a lot of these concepts for a while, but I, I just had this epiphany during one of my meetings that I was, I just realized that subconsciously I'm still pushing for failure even though I'm working yeah. on this stuff and I, I tell, I say like, yeah, it's going to do well on some level. Like I'm still automatically being like, Oh, but it's not going to do well. So that, that's kind of what yeah. I've been working. Now I'm trying to change that to it's going to go well because I feel like if I assume that it's going to do go well, I'm just going to do everything as though it would go well and that will allow it to go well. Yeah. I think that's important. You know, in a weird way, I think game dev underground and the community and the Patreon and all that stuff exists based on the fact that I thought my games weren't going to do well <laughs> based, based on a backup plan of like, what if the games don't sell? Yeah. How am I going to have a business around game dev? If yeah. the games don't sell, I really believe that. And I've started, as I've started to kind of realize that I've started to take more and more risks and like put more on the line with my game dev stuff. Because, like, I in my mind, the more that I risk on it, the more I believe in it. Right? Yeah, for sure. And it's like, 
at first it was zero risk because like, <laughs> there was zero belief there. It's like, I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to do this other stuff and then make games for the fun of it. Yeah, I'm uh, putting a but, ton of risk into my project, actually. Like, I'm invest. I'm basically going to be investing all my money, and I've already invested, like, a decent amount. That's but, terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'm also in a very different position than you, because I'm, I'm yeah. kind of at the start of my journey, I feel like. Like, you had a whole other thing you did before game dev, right? Like, for me, this is the very start of me, like, trying to really make something happen, you know? So, for me, it's like, oh, if I if I go back to zero, then whatever, you know? I can just try again. I'll start again. Yeah, you have a lot of time. Just, I think, I think a lot of people, because we have a lot of people in our community. We have younger people, and then we have like really older people too. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think it's ever too late to start again. I don't, I don't think even it's ever think it's about the age so much. It's more like, I, like you have a house, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, like you have all these things that I'm not it's it doesn't actually matter. I'm not going to go into it. It's just you have these things that are like very firm, right? And I'm I don't I'm not responsible for anyone. I don't even have a girlfriend. I don't right. have like anything that's like if I mess up then like terrible things are going to happen. I'll lose this and this and this. Like I I can kind of afford right. to go all in cuz I'm not invested in things where which uh, it's nice to have those things, of course. So there's it, it's not like one way or the other's better. It does. It does have. I see what you're saying. So, like, yeah. The I think a lot of people, the older they get, the more they um, have to lose, yeah. kind of deal. Like, they if they have a career or they have, uh, like, a family is a big one that comes up a lot in the community. Like, mm -hmm. people are like, I can't fail on this game anymore because, yeah. like, I have two kids and a wife, and like, this is our savings, right? Like, yeah, which that's a whole other conversation and whether or not you should actually be in that position. But like, yeah, I get it. I understand it. And like, I, I do think if, if you are younger, I think it's the perfect time to just go crazy and go all in on something. Cause you do have less yeah. to lose a lot of times. Yeah. I hope, I hope that's right. Cause that's kind of been my mindset in the past couple of years. Like my parents have often told me to start saving, invest in stocks, do invest. But to me, this is the time when I can afford to take risks still. And I can still get yeah. into like investments and that kind of like lot more long term thing later, you know. Yeah, I I do think there's something to be said about investing early, though. for sure, because of compound interest and like right. It, it you, scales you know the, a you know lot. the yeah. deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, ten or twenty extra years is quite a bit for some kind of investment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but, but. Again, it's like, how much do you believe in your project, right? Because yeah. like me with investing, it's always been like, okay, do I invest in like an index fund or do I invest in my own company? Yep. Like where, where is the value? Yeah, I kind of see that too. Like see it that way. You, you see, it's a big question because it's like, okay, well, this is pretty stable, right? Like it's a smaller return. It's, it's low risk, low reward. This is high risk, high reward mm -hmm. for like your own company. Right. And it, it really comes down to like, how much do you believe in it? And I think how much you believe in it, especially like the less people you have involved, how much you believe in it directly correlates to like how much motivation you have and how much how you feel about it and how, how much you yeah. want to push it. And and um, it can affect your mental health quite a bit, too, because it's like if subconsciously you don't believe in it and you're not no. taking any risks, your actions speak to your mind a lot more than anything you say to it. Right. Yeah. And it's course. like that can affect all of your other decisions and stuff, too. So, yeah, the mind, it's it's so strange because it's I don't think you can necessarily change. like maybe you can. But changing your mind without changing the actions you're taking is very difficult. I think they play into each other very heavily. Yeah. Which is why I think like I was taking a lot of action, but I hadn't really been meditating as much as I normally was. I hadn't been right. taking the time to address my mind in a way. So now I've taken yeah. kind of a week where I wasn't really posting as much as I was on TikTok. I missed a YouTube video and I wasn't working on my game as much, but I've gotten back into meditation and I've started doing self-hypnosis on myself. So I've just kind of pushed more on my mind and now I'm kind of ready to get back into the action taking part while maintaining some of the mind maintenance mind maintenance <laughs> i think there's a there's an argument for the balance of it right because like i've i've been i've always had struggle with balance and i've been off both deep ends i've been like all action 
no thought like yeah. boom 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 just do all the thing and then all thought no action and while both of those have their own kind of advantages and i think part of the reason why i am who i am so i spend a lot of time alone thinking and doing all the the thoughts and self-improvement stuff um i think taking the action and then continually reminding yourself why you're taking the action and especially if you're trying to change something about a belief or something like that mm -hmm. like uh i think it's it's the ultimate uh kind of mix right you can prove to yourself with your action over and over again that you're you're changing and you're doing things better yeah. um especially if you're focusing on something you control right mm -hmm. like daily videos on youtube for me were a big thing because that put that took the focus off of uh the subscriber count or the view yeah. count or whatever all these things that i can't really control like i kind of can but not really uh and there would be videos i would put up that i would I would be totally sure they were going to get thousands of views and tons of subscribers and they wouldn't and that would like destroy my self-esteem but when i started focusing on just okay i'm going to do a video a day a video a day a video a day and that's yeah. the thing i control and i could do that and that really 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 helped my rhythm and it made me more disciplined and there this is crazy shit. like we went through a hurricane i had severe sunburn i had like major like toothaches and stuff yeah. and i still managed to do daily videos and it was i would tell myself like you're disciplined. This is what you're doing. This is why you're doing it because you committed yeah. to this. And, and it really, really helped me kind of refactor who I was because for a long time, like I thought I was this lazy dude that couldn't finish anything. Yeah. And that transition really helped me quite a bit. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's an amazing thing to do and what you did because it builds so much confidence because what you did yeah. is you put something outside of yourself, like it actually not outside of yourself, the opposite. You put something that is completely in your control as your measurement for right. success which yeah the the danger which is it's something that i've done too not necessarily intentionally but it's very common to try and measure something that you have no control over like oh do people yeah. like me oh no one likes me so i'm worthless or right. oh i have no followers so i'm worthless oh i have no money so i'm worth which money arguably you can control but that's a whole nother conversation but when you yeah. put it on something like, oh, I'm going to post a video every day. Or for me, like I was going to the gym every day for a while. Like when it's something like that, it's completely in your control and you're building that core confidence that right. lets you do everything else. Yeah. Well, uh, like weight loss is a good, the gym is a perfect example, right? A lot of people focus on the actual weight, but weight can fluctuate no. depending on the types of food that you eat, how much water you drink like all kinds of stuff. And so one day you go on the scale and you've gained four pounds yep. and you're just like, Oh, the world is ending. I'm doing this. I'm working out. I'm dieting, but you, you can't really control that aspect of it, but you can't go to the gym every day. Yep. You can't eat that healthier food, right? You can control your diet and your calories and all that stuff. And focusing on the stuff that you can control is important. That being said, you can't, there's some stuff that you want to have as goals that you, that you can't control. Like money is a perfect example. Yeah. Right. Like how well your game is going to do. There's arguments to be made that you, you can control it or you can't control it. It's actually, I think it's both. Yeah. 100 <laughs> There's a lot of things cool. that you can do to increase the sales that you get, but you are not in direct control of a thousand things. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's pretty chaotic. And so even in that, if you have revenue targets, that's cool. But you need to make a list of all the things that you can do, action items that you can control to get to that point. And you got to go hard and do those things. And at the end of the day, if you don't meet the revenue target, um, you know. So what is you your did mindset your set for when you want to release a game or a product? Like you, you have the revenue goals as well. And then you have a kind of separate list of these are the actionable things I'm going to keep myself to doing. Is that kind of your thought process? Yeah, so... So Battle Barn is a good example. Uh, so the way, so I want to make ten thousand dollars year one with Battle Barn mm -hmm. uh, on launch. Currently, at the current iteration of the game, that's going to change if we if we overshoot our our target because I'm currently still aiming about five or six hundred hours, and I want to make about ten grand uh, over the year. Yeah. In order to do that, what I calculated. Uh, I forget what the number was, but basically I assumed that we were going to have a 50% conversion rate day one on wish lists. Mm -hmm. So that I calculated, I, I did the math. If I do, uh, it was like 10,000 
uh, divided by it was I think we we're gonna sell it for like thirteen bucks divided by thirteen, which was seven hundred and ninety or seven hundred sixty nine units, mm-hmm. and then uh, we needed about twice that many um, wish lists, which was about fifteen hundred and thirty eight wish lists. And so that that was my target for what we're doing. And currently, we're at about we're about right about half that, yeah. Uh, as far as wish lists. So then I break it down further and say, okay, well, I need about fifteen hundred wish lists, right? Like, what can I actually do uh, to get those? And I have a marketing plan based on that. So, outreach to press, outreach to influencers, um, press releases. Uh, I have story beats lined up. So like, this is a thing that we added. This is a thing. I have tie-ins like. You were a playtest for a plunder party with yeah. the pirates. Pirates are an offshoot of that game. All that stuff's going to tie into the game and all that stuff. So, yeah, and you're essentially what I'm doing. I'm separately something. for those games. Yeah. So, and hopefully they'll they'll help sell each other, right? Yeah. It's it's um, like the Marvel scheme of everything's connected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making my own MCU, yeah. but with uh, weird animal characters. Yeah. So, but I've taken this thing that. Um, technically i can't control and i've broken it down into a series of action steps uh that i can control right yeah. and that's what i'm gonna do and if we don't hit the revenue target uh i might you know turn it up to 11 and try everything twice as hard mm-hmm. but if that doesn't work ultimately i'm gonna be like all right next project let's try it again yeah yeah there's only so much you can do and then you just move on yeah. to the next project i do think it's important to note that like my my philosophy with this really is quantity uh, over quality. And I know that's that gets very people get all weird about that because that means different things to different people, and they think you're just trying to poop out shit games <laughs> to make money. That's not what I'm trying to do. But what I'm trying to say is like I'm I'm really, and I didn't used to look at it this way, but I, I really look at it as like a studio now, like a five years worth of games, not this one game, right? Yeah. And because of that, like I'm I know that the majority of game companies fail with their first project, right? Either the project never gets done or the project doesn't meet the revenue target and the company closes. Mm -hmm. Like, so I've already passed the biggest uh, hurdle that most companies face. And I know that this is a, this is a long game, right? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so the more titles you can build out, the more passive revenue you can build, which the more passive revenue you have, the more you can invest into projects. And so really it's not about making a hit game for me. It's about surviving long enough to have a product catalog Mm -hmm. that pays for the development. Right. I think it's also a massive kind of assumption and generalization from people to assume that if you work less time on a game, it's just naturally worse because everyone like cyberpunk 2077, for example, eight years of development and Mm -hmm. It has not met expectations. Like just, just generally, there's a lot of outrage. There's a lot of bugs. Like it's, it's not what it. It's not a perfect game. I don't think anyone would argue that it's a perfect game. Let's just say that. And I'm not too invested in it one way or the other. But my point is, you can spend less time on something and still make something amazing. Like there's not a direct correlation between time and quality, because you can you can spend like two years remaking the same thing over and over, and then by the end, it's worse than it was at the start. Yeah, it's it's a really weird counterintuitive concept, right? Like yeah. and especially like the newer you are to the industry, the less you you understand that, especially with anything creative. And I think the more skill you gain too, mm-hmm. the faster you get to that eighty percent. Like if you're a really high profile artist, yeah. you can draw something and get it to eighty percent beauty in it very quickly. Yeah. And then the last twenty percent can actually take another eighty percent of the time, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I'm glad that you're on board with this because this is something I've been obsessed with. Is this is a I don't, concept I don't I'm want... also very behind. Like the my I, game Alien Life Simulator, I don't intend to take more than like three ish months on it. Like my intended yeah. release, I'm not going to say exactly, but February, like pretty much guaranteed. Um, and the one caveat con- is if I really feel like it's a bad game or it's just not ready for some reason because I'm already doing play testing. Then I will release it in early access first. But regardless of what happens, I'm going to release it. And yeah. that's just because I don't feel like it should take longer to make it. Because I don't think longer makes it better. I think a uh, like analogy that might be helpful to some people who aren't familiar with game development is on like multiple choice tests in, in school. Everyone's gone through that. 
when you your first answer is normally the best answer like if you keep changing your answers and second guessing yourself it's probably yeah. going to be wrong like it's just following your instinct yeah. is kind of better and kind of the same thing with game development potentially if you just keep iterating it, you might be making it worse like spending longer and longer and longer in something does not just equal better right there's a there's a there's a like an 80 20 amount of like iteration time right yeah and given too much time you you do actually make things worse and i think i think the other caveat to that is that you have to scope properly yeah right so which like I... <laughs> cyberpunk 2077 uh they took eight years which is a long ass time to make a game yeah but maybe they should have took maybe it should have you know it was like maybe a 10-year project <laughs> at this oh, point because no. like my penis popped out while I was walking down the street and like I managed to walk into a building that wasn't loaded and then the building loaded around me and locked me in. Do you know so, what's funny? stuff like that? I've played for seven hours. I haven't had a single bug. Not a single Not one. Not a single bug. Like if I, you play I'm an slow, anomaly. You... I am an anomaly. <laughs> I I'm about eight and a half hours in, so I'm probably right where you're at. If you like yeah. I've noticed most of the bugs happen when I'm like speeding through the city on a car, like it's just the uh, processor can't handle. What are you playing on though? Uh ten eighty. Oh, you're playing on PC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most yeah, I'm on Xbox One. Oh, I've which heard I've that's... heard that most of the bugs are there, like yeah. the older gen consoles. Yeah. Um I mean I've yeah, seen but... some pretty crazy bugs on PC too, but yeah. Yeah. It's well, you know, it that's one of those things too. It's like that game is clearly not done, but regardless of how long it takes, it it was probably over scoped for the time that they did, right? They say a yeah. big patch is gonna come January, February. They should have probably pushed it to January, February, but they potentially they've not though. Times. But I feel like potentially it's not overscoped because I I don't I'm not familiar with how long The Witcher Three took, but I I assume it took less because they didn't have nearly as big of a budget. And I feel like The Witcher Three is in some ways more ambitious. Like I think gameplay wise, it's more complex. I don't know. I I feel and I feel like they did a really good job with it comparatively. Oh yeah, no, the game. I love the game. Yeah. I lo it's it's. It gives me old school like Deus Ex vibes, and I love the the futuristic. I've been waiting for a game like this forever. It's not even this game specifically, but just like an open yeah. world RPG in the future in like a futuristic setting. city. Right, it's great. Um, and I'm having, and it was worth every penny of it. Um, I maybe wish I would have bought it on PC instead of Xbox, but that's yeah, <laughs> that's a different deal. But like I'm saying, so like we were talking about the the amount of time that you spend on something doesn't necessarily make it better. But yeah. that's assuming that you you scoped it properly, right? Um, I've made that mistake several times. So, like with my game Cypherpunk, one of the things that really discouraged me was that like I wanted to do this 500 hour and then a thousand hour project. Like it it started as 500 hour, but then I went to a thousand. I feel like hour. the scope just kept and, going up though. Like because I, I followed yeah, your progress it, on the game. <laughs> it was a lesson that I learned, right? I started off with this little like one screen puzzle game, and then by the end, it was like this giant procedurally generated like craziness yeah uh and i you know i run a youtube channel on game dev i've talked about scope creep a lot but it i'm still susceptible to it right yeah and then when i when i paused that project and i started working on battle barn i was like okay i'm not going to do the same thing but i kind of did yeah but i learned a little bit right like i learned it i'm like okay well i'm not gonna i'm not gonna change the core yeah there was uh, some maybe add feature here and there you you i feel like you definitely did a better job with that concerning scope creep better yeah and and again i still think i made some mistakes and it's still like a little scoped a little higher than i wanted like but the then way with my i'm other trying games, to like... handle that is i'm because i actually have like if i describe my concept for my game it's like a crazy scope it's like open world roguelike life simulator like all these genres combined but what i'm trying the ways i'm trying to simplify it are kind of what i think of as like the mario nintendo theory which is taking one core idea or mechanic and then just tying everything to it and in my yeah. game's case, that's the emotion uh, mechanic, which is basically you have to manage your emotions. And I'm basically trying to tie every everything as much as I can into that concept rather than yeah. creating new features always, uh, trying to just tie everything together so I'm doing much less but getting much more. I think that's a solid formula for a good indie game. Yeah. And then the other thing that, that I 
a lot of the like my design philosophy is kind of built out of restriction and, and the limits because as like essentially solo devs i work with an artist but i'm the only programmer and you you're in a similar situation where you you also do the art so it's even worse for you like we we have limited resources right unless we want to work on a game for like 20 years <laughs> which some pe which some yeah. indie devs do to be fair like uh i don't know how yeah <laughs> i did four and that was like a prison sentence <laughs> yeah yeah so i know. like one of the concepts for my game is simply is that you, there's no dialogue right because i thought oh i don't want to hire voice actors that sounds expensive so i thought of the motion wheel to communicate through emotions instead of dialogue like that's one of the core ideas of the game brought out of limitations and then another thing i thought is i don't want to like this is just a general thing with roguelikes right like the reason why roguelikes are so popular and roguelites in indie games is because you get exponentially more content with less content because you're combining all of your content into right. all these sets to make way more potentially right that was a lesson that i picked up on cypherpunk but i really implemented in battleborn too is like with the units uh the units are both the enemies and the player the units are the ais but also the playable characters yeah. they're also the unlockable characters right so like one piece of content can be multiplied by like five yeah and that's the value that you get out of it um i think smarter design like that is is almost always better and i i think was, we're talking about time investment i think there is there's a there's an elegant design to everything right there's elegant yeah. solutions that solve multiple problems at once that don't necessarily take more time they actually shave time off mm -hmm. but they're better in every way so they take less time but they're better and those aren't always obvious right and yeah. sometimes it takes a more seasoned designer to see them and and really and i say see them not invent them because i just feel like <laughs> it's weird how creativity works right but yeah. um yeah it's i've started to realize the power of design and like ultimately this is manifested more in like my physical card games that i'm working on too and like my my burnout phase where i've just worked on physical prototypes i've started to realize like how yeah you pushed that's into all card games space. are yeah it's it's the pure design because there's no technical engine behind it there's yeah. no algorithm that determines how the ai works or whatever it's all design and, and like that so to me was the most elegant form of it yeah and it, you can it's kind of see beautiful. like ideas from board games creeping into video games oftentimes like even among us which is one of the biggest games this year this whole idea of like deception mechanics that's been a thing in board games longer than anywhere yeah. else with stuff like secret hitler werewolf mafia yeah you see the uh the fortnite thing i did what is the fortnite thing <laughs> fortnite has a, an among us mode now Oh no! <laughs> like basically, I mean, they were like, "Oh, let's make it PUBG." Oh, now we're gonna make it Among Us. Don't mind me; I'm just um, installing Fortnite. <laughs> that's, yeah, that was fascinating. That's a whole other question of like, you know, it's it's just an interesting little thing. Like, they're are they innovating or are they just copying? And what's the smarter business move? You know, that's kind like, of what Blizzard had always did, in my opinion, is they took a like tried and proven concept and they took it and then polished it and gave it like that blizzard stamp right and like oftentimes yeah. simplified it like That's overwatch is team fortress 2 hearthstone is magic the gathering i don't know what world of warcraft right. is because i'm too young for that but <laughs> there were plenty um but yeah no i i think a lot of creativity works like that right like a lot of like we're both working on roguelites mm -hmm. and uh those are iterations of other things that we've consumed in the past. Yeah. Um, and I think you, you see things from a different perspective than other people. So you can take a thing that you like and put your perspective on it and make it interesting and make it unique. Yeah. As long as you're putting your own spin, your own person, you're, you have to like inject your personality into it <laughs> Yeah. and then it becomes your own and then it can be interesting. But the, the base idea yeah. doesn't have to be something like mind blowing the original like there's billions of humans beings it's hard to come up with something that's never been done yeah. before yeah for real i i think too like there is a value in taking something you like and simplifying it or yeah. taking something you like and like making it the entire game like there's a lot of games that have like 20 mechanics 
and you could take one of those mechanics and just like you're doing make that entire game out yeah. of it yeah it's fascinating how uh, this uh, game design is so fast so massive there's yeah. so much to it you can do anything and you can copy stuff and you can steal stuff and you can put stuff together and you can uh, uh it's one of the things that fascinates me so much about it is that it's just like every every art form combined all together yeah I in one it. little design package yeah i i feel like you learn so much doing it as well just in general yeah i've learned a lot about psychology and human behavior yeah exactly and i'm i'm Never also trying to do the inverse now like i i want my game to have like psycho psychological <laughs> psychological and self-helpy concepts built into the design yeah like with the with the emotion system for example i'm trying to like it's connected to another system called love hate which is like backed by a bunch of research and science and et cetera. Et cetera. so i want the building of relationships to actually be tied to how building relationships actually works for example that's cool what inspired that i i've always kind of wanted to do this like, cause I'm such a self-help junkie. Like I, <laughs> I, I've been into self-help about as long as I've been into actually a little bit less as long, but about, almost as long as I've been into game development, I've been into self-help. So I've just always had this idea that I want to have a positive impact on people's lives. Uh, but I don't want to do something like preachy cause some of the things that have had the most impact on me are like my favorite movie fight club which that movie's highly entertaining. It's a great movie, but it also was a slap in my face to that made me realize, shit, I need to be doing more. I need to be appreciating yeah. life more. I need to like really take advantage of life and not just be a consumer. So yeah. I want to have, I'm hoping eventually to have that same impact through my games of giving people epiphanies, helping people in a more subtle way. Like th I, I want my games to just be fun, right? So people can just play them and they'll just be having fun. And then it'll be like, oh shit, wait, I, this actually ties into real life. And then like, they have like ideas naturally. Good art makes you feel stuff, right? Yeah. It's about the only definition I can come up with for what is art. Makes you feel something. Yeah. I, uh, my mind yeah, always goes to the banana tape to the wall when I think about art and the definition of art. <laughs> That, like sold it makes me feel something jealous i hadn't thought of it <laughs> exactly everyone <Sold> it. <laughs> it makes everyone think something <laughs> <laughs> oh man i have my own share of parodies and and art things that i've done yeah. but i think i at first i thought when i when i made final phobia i poured so much of myself into that game and i really look at it as art like uh, the the publisher is even listed as tim russwick Versus all my other games are listed as Skullback Studios, which is my actual company. Yeah. Like, just because it's such a personal thing for me. But, like, then at Battleborn, I tried to do the opposite of, like, okay, well, what if I just did all the the, the dumb shit that I want to do? Like, all the crazy animals and the pirates and the puns and the... But at first, I thought it didn't have any emotion into me. But then I realized it was just a different side of me. Yeah, it was a different... fun, playful side. Right. It was a different part of me. and I And I find myself pouring emotions into it the same way that I did with Phobia, but it's maybe in a little more... I don't even want to say positive because I feel like even as deep and dark as that game was, I think it was positive for me, and I've definitely gotten emails from people that it's been positive for them. Yeah. Uh, helping them work through stuff. So, I don't know. I, when I revisit that game, I some of that darkness comes back. I mean, it goes so back I to the it. usefulness of all emotions, right? Like, yeah. Like maybe now it's not useful for you to go back to that game because it gives you for like me those dark, yeah, yeah for specifically for you, but yeah, when you were making it, it needed to be made. You know that those right. were the feelings that you were going through, and that yeah. was your experience. And now for other people, it has also been really helpful to play that game to experience it because they've yeah. gone through similar experiences. Yeah, I, what I was surprised is like a lot of people. Because I based the game on the five stages of grief, and I was kind of talking about loss as in like loss of a relationship or loss of a significant other. Yeah. But a lot of people actually messaged me and they said that like loss of a loved one, like death and that kind of thing, that it really helped them through that. 
And I was like, that was not something that I ever intended. Um, but it's, it's fascinating how you can build something like final phobia was such early on in my game dev career yeah. that like, I never really had given thought to how people were going to experience it and what they were going to take away from it. Like I never sat down and think like, okay, what do I want people to, to get from this? Um, it was more of like, do you think what about I want that a lot now? Feel. Yeah, I do. I do. I, I, with plunder party, it was like, it was really based around the idea of like, I want people to have fun and I want it to be a, a very fun interaction between people, mm -hmm. right? Murder bunnies, which you haven't played yet, but it's, it's very strategic and I want them to when feel When am I going to get to play Tim? <laughs> you are soon. I'm, I'm finalizing the cards as we speak. I wanted to have them done this week, but it was probably going to be after holidays now because yeah. I really wanted the professional early print run to be done now, but. Yeah, so nah. the the fun party vibe is what you wanted with Plunder Party. Right. Battle Barn, I want uh tactical gameplay, but I still I want a lot of the uh the um I want a light inquisitive uh strategy game. Like actually the one this is weird, but one of the pillars of Battle Barn is like I want to be able to play this game while I'm listening to a podcast or watching something, mm -hmm. right? Like it's fun and entertaining, but it doesn't take your full focus. Yeah. Um, which is one of the things that I really like about it because I've gotten really into podcasts a lot lately, and uh, it sucks because a lot of games you can't you can't really can't play, play without them, the audio. Yeah. yeah, and like I've been trying to find a good like podcast game because there's plenty of times where I want the podcast, but like it doesn't take my full attention, and so like it's great while I'm driving or something like that, but like when I'm just sitting, like I want to listen to a podcast just sitting here, but like. I want entertainment. I don't want to like if I'm done for working for the day or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's great while doing art or whatever. But uh, that's yeah. why I like so roguelikes I, and roguelites because I feel yeah. like a lot of them are kind of more in that vein where you can do something else. They don't necessarily well, you, require your full attention. You know what I realized too, and I realized this in retrospect, but I think I was designing Cypherpunk very similarly because. Before I paused it, that game had no audio. I had I the whole game was based on visual feedback. Yeah. Still, there's no audio at all in the game. That's crazy. And we're we're pretty deep into the game, and the game looks beautiful. It looks almost like a finished product, yeah. but it still has no audio. I didn't realize. And I realized, that. <laughs> I know because it's so like visually juicy, and it comes off as like it it looks polished. I think audio is going to take it to the next level. Yeah, for sure, because it's so like visually juicy as it is, but. I realize that, like, especially with everything that I've added to it, it makes it a lot more fun to play uh, while just listening to something. I've actually went back to it recently and started doing that, playing through it, and I have some ideas on how to fix it. That clarity is super important too, by the way. That yeah, you know. giving yourself space. Yeah. Yeah, I've also had yeah. some realizations about my game now that I've taken like a couple days off from working on it. So I do think space is big. It's it's extra big when you're solo, like when you're working on the thing by yourself, because it's yeah. like you do not have the clarity to see what this thing needs when you're in the trenches, right? It's like trying to make a map when you're like you dug a hole six feet in the ground. You can't you can't see outside of those walls that you build for yourself, right? Yeah, you gotta like go somewhere and take a walk, and then you get the whole yeah, landscape the overview, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's I think the longer in a weird you way, I think my game is in a lot of ways the opposite of like a traditional rogue light. Cause I, like I, my goal is like long runs where normally you have very short runs. Cause I, my idea is that it's like the, the lifespan of this alien. So I don't want the lifespan to be 10 minutes cause that feels weird. And I do want it to re require attention. I, so I, what we were talking about where I like roguelites often because you don't need to give them attention, whereas my game, right. I feel like, probably will demand attention. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm yeah. kind of making like an inverse roguelite, roguelite. <laughs> no, but there's 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 value in that too. Like I um I like really immersive games too because like I, I think it's something to do like with ADD or attention span or whatever. Yeah. Um, why I want to listen to podcasts and do other things that like I want to do more than one thing. 
But at the same time, the games that are done really well, that are very atmospheric, I like to fully immerse myself in them. So put on headphones, dim the lights, like yeah. go into the game, become the game. And uh, those those hold me pretty well too. They have to be really well done and very atmospheric, and they need to use all of the senses and and that kind of thing. Uh, and there's only been a few that I played, but simulation games and stuff like that are usually up there. With yeah. like, there's always a new task, and you you got to manage this, and this crazy stuff happens, and it, it's very engaging for me. So I totally understand that. For sure. What is your mind? Because you've started so many projects and you've finished fi- uh, final. Dude, you're, the name of that game, I don't know why, but I always want to say Final Phobia. Phobia. Everybody wants to say Final Phobia. It's been called Father Phobia. Like, Jesus, man. I don't know. Uh, it's PH, Philophobia. PH. People call it PP. I'll call it PH. <laughs> there you go. PH but gets acidic. I feel like you've talked a lot about finishing stuff, but I think starting something also takes a lot. Like taking that leap to really start working on a new project, I I think that yeah. can also be difficult for a lot of people. So what drives you, or what what is the like mindset that puts you in a position to do that? Because you you worked on the the love game, <laughs> then you worked the on Cypherpunk, the PH, yeah, the PH, yeah, and then you worked uh, on Battle Barn Tactics, and you also did like tons of Game Jam games in between, some of which you released on mobile. Um, I think that was 14 before. physical prototypes before murder bunnies and planter party. Yeah. Were See, and started. then you did all these physical games, yeah. Like you have a large output. Then that's not even talking about all of your social media. Dude, I don't have an answer for that. I've never had a problem starting. I've yeah. only had problems finishing. I feel like my entire life has been trying to gain control of my brain mm. because it's outputting all the time. Yeah, which it, it makes YouTube and it makes Twitch and it makes game dev and makes all this a really good format for me, right? Because it can kind of channel my output. Um, but there's been periods like this this burnout period. There's a big period where I didn't want to do anything. I didn't mm-hmm. want to look at anything. I didn't want to mess with anything. I, so I do think it comes with downsides too. Like I think I overextend myself sometimes by just constantly outputting. Um, I think maybe there's a little bit of like insecurity and like w- I want to be good enough mm-hmm. in there that um, drives you to make the stuff. Yeah, and, and I do think that like since starting the channel, um, I think the public visibility on a lot of my stuff maybe helps. Well, I don't really know, man. I wish mm-hmm. I wish I did because. There's a lot of stuff that I've hidden from the public that I really like hiding that I don't want them to see. And it yeah. almost makes it more motivating. I mean, having like some things that are private is important. Yeah. So I I don't know. I think everybody has their own struggle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and finishing has always been a major struggle for me. It still is. And like the um, I have the ability to like step outside of myself and look at myself and say, Tim, like what are you doing and when i look at cypherpunk stop midway through look at battle barn it's currently in progress and now i started two physical projects murder bunnies and plunder party which are spin-offs of battle barn yeah my when i look at myself in third person i'm like yo what the fuck are you doing that's a lot of projects what are you, are you breaking them rules yeah. what are you doing uh but then when i have them like personally like from my perspective it's like okay they all have different mm-hmm really different emotions tied to them and really different feelings and they all kind of cover different aspects of uh kind of my personality and who i am and i think it makes bouncing between them a lot easier and at least what i tell myself i don't know if this is accurate but i i think my theory is that it will help with future burnout because i think the burnout uh originally was just sitting on this one thing over and over again constantly broadcasting it constantly working towards this goal no breaks, no nothing, just this one thing, whether I like it or not, all the time. Yeah, and I think it made it very really, really projects stressful. you can bounce between. Right. I th- I think it keeps me energized. And so even though I feel like I'm making less progress time-wise because I'm working a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, um, I feel like I'm I'm much more energized. Yeah, and it's like even with Murder Bunnies right now. So I'm in the I'm in the final production stages of the Murder Bunnies cards. Uh, where I'm designing the final cards, but Plunder Party is is super early, 
in its development. And so it's like I'm trying to get the I have 20 more bunnies to like colorize and pose properly for the cards. Yeah. And so I'm trying to get through that because I really want to get back to Plunder Party so we could do more play tests because that was really fun. Right. So it's like it's kind of keeping me motivated to to do all that stuff. That being said, I'm I'm limiting myself because I, I want to keep starting <laughs> right now. Like I got like five other things I yeah. want to start, but I'm like, no, 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 no. At this point, you got to finish one before you start a new one. Maybe um, I think everybody has a lot of ideas, right? Like for the most yeah. part, because I, I think I have a similar personality to you in the sense that I don't really struggle with starting things. I It's more finishing things like I canceled yeah. the online game project that no one that's listening to this would know about but i talked with you about and right. i just was wondering what what it is that like lets us start because i do know people that struggle with starting rather yeah. than with finishing and what i'm thinking now is maybe it's like for me personally i don't think i judge the starting like if i right. have an idea i'll just like start it and i don't care like i'm not like worried about how it's gonna go yeah I'm just kind of free, like, this is an idea I have. I'm just going to do it, and I don't really care how it goes, like, at least initially. And that lets the ball get rolling. Maybe this is helpful to those people, because when when you said that, it kind of brought something in mind. Like, I have, have, like, buckets in my head that I put stuff in. Mm -hmm. And when I start a project, it, like, has has no commitment whatsoever. It has nothing. It's, like, me fucking around for two hours. But then there's a phase of the project where like I put it into production mode, I yeah. guess, where it's like it moves buckets and suddenly this now is going to be a finished project mm-hmm. and I have to take it more seriously. But like like I said, I had 14 prototypes uh, for Plunder Party and Murder Bunnies. Uh, all of those were like spent an hour to making a thing, played it, it sucked, threw it away. I don't even remember the rules for half of them because it's like I didn't even write them down. Yeah. It was just I played it. I made a bunch of cards. I tried this, boom. And then Murder Bunnies actually came about from a dream after I had made like five or six of them and it had elements from like all of them. Hmm. Right. So it was like, it, it is like the culmination of like multiple prototypes that I had made yeah. and it just worked out completely elegantly. Plunder Party was actually a space goods game originally about building spaceships, but it just made more sense because we were stealing each other's shit. It's just, yeah. um, well, what if they were pirates? And then, oh, I got the pirates, so I'll just completely, like... Yeah, just merge you know, it all. Um, right. And I think Plunder Party and, and Murder Bunnies, like, they have made that transition to uh, production. The, the production mode bucket. Like, I have a Space Goods game that I'm working on, but it's it's just, like, I'm, I'm okay with throwing it away or trashing it or starting a new game or doing whatever. There's no pressure on it, basically. Yeah. Like, there's no timeline, there's no pressure... I can throw it away, I can change it, I can interact, I can do whatever I want. Whereas like Murder Bunnies and Plunder Party, I feel a responsibility to finish and to to work on and to get where it needs to go. Yeah. Um I think that So makes maybe sense. that would help. I think that would yeah, help. I mean, I mean I can't speak for them, but and then I think on the inverse, what I the the setting the like short uh development time cycles, right? This I this whole concept, I feel like that's kind of designed to finish, right? Because when you have a stricter deadline and you, you're yeah. like, okay, three months, then I'm done. Like that forces you to actually finish the game versus right. like some people can have no deadline in a sense and just be working on the game and they're not worried about yeah. finishing it because they're like, oh, I'll just finish it when I finish it. Which for me, I, I, I would never finish the game then. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it really comes down to your motivation level, right? Like, yeah. or your motivation type, like what gets you going, what gets you motivated. And like, I, I don't have the attention span for these longer projects. Father phobia took me four years, but like there was periods of three, six, nine months where I didn't work on it at all. Yeah. I'd be working on other things. Like I think it was like 20 some games that I made while making father phobia, like game jam games and other projects. Like it was a, there was, bunch there was a of lot stuff. of games. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of games I made while making a game. Uh, so, I in realizing that and being res, uh, what's the word responsible? I was going to say reflective is reflective. the word. Being reflective of that, I'm responsible too, I guess. Uh, but being reflective of that, like I realized that, like okay, I I want to build a business around the things that I am naturally inclined to do. Mm-hmm. rather than try and change myself and change this force of nature 
to adapt into the perfect way to do business and be miserable, yeah. right? I want to build a business around the things that I'm naturally inclined to do. You know what I'm naturally inclined to do? Stay up till 5 a.m. Fucking sleep Same. till noon. Like all this, you know what I mean? Like all of this stuff that everybody tells me is wrong with me or whatever fucking society doesn't agree with. Like that's who I naturally am as a person. And in addition to that, attention spans of a couple months for a project is where I'm at. So yeah. I'm convinced and I'm convinced that I can build a project within that attention span. Like look at Cypherpunk, man. It like yeah. it extended its fucking warranty. <laughs> You know, like it stayed too long in my life and then it just, I, I fucked it up because it just <laughs> lasted too long. Yeah. But ironically, after six months off of it, like I'm starting to get back into it and I think I can finish that and, and get it where it needs to be. But like, I don't want to do that again. I want to find a scope for a project that I can stick to that fits within that first wave of like excitement and, and motivation. And I think if I can do that and I can do that consistently I'm going to have a fucking great life because yeah. it's going to be this whole business is going to be built around, you know, who I am as a person. And uh, I, I want to facilitate that rather than vice versa. I was like, you should adapt yourself and you should work 16 hours a day and make this, you know, no, I yeah. want a lifestyle business is what I want. I yeah, want a lifestyle. I, I feel like happy. that applies to so many parts of life. Like what you mentioned at the start yeah. with sleep schedule too, or yeah. like I've resisted that for a lot of my life, but right now I'm just kind of letting it happen. Like I, I woke yeah. up at 3 PM and my, my today's my birthday, but my birthday was basically split into two parts happy where motherfucker birthday. <laughs> yeah. He, you already wished me happy birthday, but thank you again <laughs> for the podcast sake. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> It'd but, be rude of me if I just didn't yeah, say Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Fine. No, I understand. <laughs> But like the, my day was split into two halves where I was awake until like 10 a.m. So that, that was like the yeah. first half of my birthday, the morning half. Then I went to sleep and I woke up at like 3 p.m. Now this is the second half of my day. So like my days are like this weird. <laughs> it's an advantage. Like most people don't get that. But I think there's a stigma, especially in the United States, against people that sleep in late uh, that, that they're somehow lazy. But I've actually read research and they're, it's called like delayed onset something but it's like people that naturally have circadian rhythms that are later uh yeah. than other people and it's like perfectly natural and i have 32 years of experience now in understanding that no matter what i do yeah. my sleep schedule will naturally gravitate towards a 2 or 3 a.m bedtime yeah. no matter what like i can I've managed to keep it for six months or a year at like a 10 or 11 PM, like with very strict guidelines and lighting rules and, yeah. you know, t t timers and all this stuff. But like, that's fucking hard to maintain yeah. that. And like, I, if I let myself go and I let myself be natural, it'll slowly slip by like a half hour, an hour a day, like slowly until I stops. end up going to bed two or 3 AM. It stops. At it two stops. Or 3 yeah. See, it stops. You know Sometimes I push it farther then yeah. I, I'll, I can maintain that. But like, yeah, it wants to be right around there. Do you know what's messed up about mine that I discovered recently? It just keeps going and it'll keep going to the point where it'll be early again. Like it'll, it'll do like the full cycle of like, you're going to bed late and then you're going to bed so late that it's in the day. And then you're going to bed so late that it's early again. Like you I just I, become nocturnal. <laughs> no, like it, I became nocturnal, but then I also became like a normal person. Like I, <clears throat> last week it was like eight, I would go to bed at like 8 PM. And that started like at like, <laughs> so I just went through the full cycle. You know, I've done that a couple times. And one of the things that helped me, I went through like, there was a, uh, like four or five years ago, I went through like a list of like 70 things to help with sleep. Like I tried literally everything and yeah. I recorded what happened. I found like a giant list somewhere and I just went through <laughs> all of them. Um, and at, the thing that helped the most was starting my day with a ritual. But also, like, even as simple as, like, I, so when I get up in the morning now, um, I'm not allowed to check my phone until, like, I make the bed, I uh, get coffee, I sit on the couch or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but then I also have to sit in some kind of sunlight. Um, and that's really, really important. The sunlight, I did, I, that was the thing I thought would work the least. But the sunlight actually worked the most. It really helped set my circadian rhythm. If immediately when I wake up, I'm exposed to sunlight, it wants to stay consistent. Yeah. If I'm not, because these are actually daylight bulbs, which gets kind of weird and dangerous. These are in my lighting. I have the same, they're the same uh, frequency as light or, or daylight, whatever. Crazy. Um, 
Yeah. So it your body there's like actual light receptors in your ears, and it can sense yes. sunlight. And it's yeah, we're covering them right now. So I think it's, <laughs> it's we're safe. Uh, but <laughs> um, sitting in the sunlight every morning kept my schedule consistent. I noticed that if I didn't do that, and especially if I stayed indoors, because I used to have blackout curtains too yeah. for the studio lights and stuff. Um, the more that I ignored the the outside day night cycle, the more my schedule would just get completely out of whack. Yeah. Uh, but staying in sunlight consistently at the same around the same time every day really helps solidify it and keep it consistent. You know the the biggest thing for me has just been COVID. Like my my way of dealing with COVID, at least in the last couple months, has just been kind of staying in my own world. Like I've created my own world where it doesn't even really yeah. matter where I am. Like. Oh, I think it's, I think every day except Friday and Sunday right now, I have a meeting and sometimes I have like multiple meetings and it, like, they're all like uh, mentorship or accountability meetings. I also have your yeah. accountability meeting with Patreon and that one overlaps with another a little bit, but that's another yeah. issue. But I, you make it though. huh? I said, you make it, you make it work. Yeah. Yeah. I make it work. But I, uh. I have like these, like almost an online life now because I realized that with the quarantine and like the, now I'm also, now I also don't want to meet people at all because I, I'm going to see my family next week uh, for Christmas. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to yeah. have any contact. I don't want to get sick. So that's been on my mind for like the past couple of weeks too. So I've just kind of adapted to Corona and my way of adapting has been like being absorbed into my computer. <laughs> yeah. Because all the meetings that I are also that with people in America. So it like completely like. Yeah. yeah, it definitely made it worse for a lot of people, I think. Um, you know, what was crazy for me is like at first, the first couple of months, I was like, this is how I live naturally. This is <laughs> I'm way more like adapted than everyone else. Yeah. All of my extrovert friends are reaching out to me for help now because it's like I've been through this shit. But then after a couple of months, it started really getting to me of yeah. like the isolation and like honestly. This is when I realized I had like an epiphany of how how little things can really affect your emotions so much. You know the thing that pissed me off the most about COVID was when Walmart stopped being open twenty four hours and I couldn't get groceries at two AM anymore. <laughs> that that was like the ultimate like betrayal of life is like that was my fucking thing man i would pop yeah. in a podcast in my earphones and go to walmart at 2 a.m and get my groceries and it's like when that stopped working i was like oh my god the world is ending <laughs> and that's when i realized like how like that routine and that ritual has become super important to me the walmart doesn't matter yeah. but it's this thing that i had done consistently over and over got interrupted by an external force and I realized like how much that could affect my mood and it made me really pay attention to all of that stuff and and kind of where I put myself and how I control my my r routines and rituals and stuff like that and and what should I focus on to control and all that stuff and that ultimately kind of so led you into the whole specific routine now stuff. or for waking up or like daily just in general because you said it made you more aware yeah, well, the morning thing is really important. Like, I do that every single morning. I uh, wake up, make the bed, uh, make coffee, sit down, and then I hang out on my phone for a little bit, um, usually reading reading stuff. And I usually, I'm very protective of what I read, too. So, like, anything with any kind of advertisement doesn't get read. A lot of times I'll schedule articles or stuff like that throughout yeah. the day, whatever, to be read the next morning. Um, sometimes I even read, uh, like, a Kindle or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um Everything else is kind of is very free flowing, feely. Yeah, like I, yeah. I feel like working on this today. I feel like I have a bunch of post-it notes of like stuff that needs to get done, and um, depending on the priority of things, like sometimes I'll do stuff I don't feel like doing, which is important when you run a business. You got to do that. But yeah. uh, generally, like if a day is a perfect day, it's it's generally working on stuff that I want to work on, and that's one of the advantages of multiple projects too. Is like. I'm always waiting to get to the next one. So I'm finishing the thing. Like I have enough discipline to where it's like, okay, even though I want to do the other thing on the other game, I got to yeah. finish this before I do it. So I constantly use that as like the carrot to get carrot myself to stick, yeah. yeah, continually do stuff. It's like whatever I want to work on, I use as the reward for getting this other thing done. And I yeah. try to throw all the boring stuff into that category. 
Um, but that morning, dude, that morning, especially the older I get, I makes me feel like an old man. But like the the older I get, the more important that stuff is to me. Like that that wake up routine is, is so important. Really so, important. Like I've I've been getting I've I've on and off had routines both for going to bed and waking up, and yeah. Now in now that I've had like this reflective time, this reflective time has essentially been me creating a morning routine again, where I am yeah. meditating or doing hypnosis on myself when I wake up and then when I go to bed. Um, and I don't know, it's just, I think it is very helpful. And when, when the gyms were open, I, that was also part of my routine was just going to the gym and yeah. it didn't, what I think is also nice is it doesn't matter. And this was a big shift for me because in the past I would need to have a consistent sleep schedule to keep my routine. And if I woke up too late, then I would just kind of fall apart. Like, oh no, now I can't do the thing. Now I can't go to the gym. Right. Which now I, this year I made the shift of it doesn't matter. Like I, I should just do the thing anyways. Like it's totally illogical. It's just like, why yeah. shouldn't I meditate just cause it's an hour later? Like, or in right. now it's why the Walmart later. thing fucked me up. <laughs> it was like, now it's closed and I can't go and do the thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's, it blows my mind how important it actually was. And it makes me wonder if it's gotten more important over time or if it was always this important. I just never understood it. I think you know? it's probably always been that important because it sets the yeah, tone for your whole got, day. Right. It really does. And it's like, if I have a really good, like, that's why I'm so protective of what I read too, because like, especially with like the, the election and all kinds of like, there's yeah, all kinds of external factors that, yeah, they can really set your mood for the whole day. And, um, before like other thing like sometimes i instead of reading i'll substitute drawing murder bunnies or just drawing murder something bunnies. for a little while yeah I, I have so much fun just drawing a random new murder bunny every morning yeah i just or love how whatever. it sounds but, out of context <laughs> i know it's great it's great it's like but that, it's like perfectly in my personality of like cute little bunnies in my style but they also are like murderous yeah and it's um but like I've noticed in, in the, the days that I start with something creative, instead of like reading and consuming, I usually tend to be more creative throughout the day. Yeah. Like, okay, well, I got one bunny done and I feel accomplished and now I want to do more stuff that's creative. Um, whereas like reading, I, I sometimes, sometimes it's, especially if I read something wrong, it's like, okay, well, now I want to go do something else. I want to go eat something first or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's it's what you're focusing focusing on, right? Yeah. It's kind of tied to what we were talking about, what you envision in the future happening or what you envision yourself accomplishing or not accomplishing sets the tone. Yeah. Like what you do at the beginning of the day sets the tone for the day. And actually what yeah. I realized too, because I, I think the big mindset shift for me wasn't actually a long-term thing. It was more of a short, short-term thing where like I would assume things are going to go bad in the short term. Like rather yeah. instead of like the whole project's going to be failure, it's It's like, oh, I can't make this thing happen in the next week or today. This is going to go bad because it, it, it's so quick, yeah. you know, at least for me where I've had like these thoughts always. So they, they just pop up naturally. And now I've been working against that. And I, I've already noticed a huge shift. Like today has been a great day for me. And I actually, even a week ago, I was saying how I hate my birthday and how I have always yeah. have a bad birthday. And that was a mindset problem. Because if you assume yeah. that you're always going to have a bad birthday, you're going to have a bad birthday. But I've had a great birthday today, yeah. even though I'm not doing anything crazy. Like, I, I love talking to you. I love, I had a meeting earlier as well. I had, I talked to my family. I, like, I've had a great day. And it's mindset. Like, because I didn't go into this day like, oh, it's going to be terrible. I went into it like yeah. it's going to be great. I've had a great day. It's all about the lens, right? Like I, I know there's some older people that I know that look at birthdays as like, ah, shit, I'm another year older. Yeah. Like, ah, it reminds me of how old I am, right? Uh, and then there's some people that are like, yo, let's celebrate life. Let's. Yeah. It doesn't matter whose birthday it is. Let's party, right? Let's have a good time. Uh, and that's all that is, is just lens. It's perspective. It's how you yeah. look at the thing. It's not the thing itself, right? The thing itself doesn't have any power, any meaning. It's, it's just a day that we celebrate. Like, and it's it really with leap year and all this other stuff, it doesn't even accurately represent the, you know, <laughs> stuff. It's just a fucking construct. 
Yep. But like, it's all how it's all the meaning you give it. Like a lot of Tony Robbins stuff talks about that, that I really like uh, resonate with is like, it's, it's less about uh, what the thing is and more about your expectation versus reality. Yeah. Right. Like if you expect it to be bad and it's good, you're going to be upset yep. and you can make it bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I think so, that applies to everything in a, in a sense. Right. It, it ties to game development too. Like if you, if you think your game's going to be bad, yeah. What's going to happen? <laughs> What's more likely to happen? Then? Yeah. <laughs> in a weird way, you can actually make your own like self-fulfilling prophecy by just thinking things, right? Like it can seep subconsciously in your work. I noticed that with Father Phobia, there were so many things that I didn't intentionally design in there that when I would go back through the game, I'd be like, whoa, <laughs> that's, I didn't expect that to be in there. Yeah. Right. Um, a lot of things. And, and I think there's a lot of subconscious uh, things that make it make its way into any creative work and you got to be you got to understand that i think the more conscious you are the more aware you are of what you're feeling and what's going on i think the more you can kind of control your lens um yeah. and and redirect some of that negative energy into more positive pathways yeah because i think a lot of stuff is on autopilot and that's yeah why a I've lot been, more than we realize for yeah. sure and that's why i've been getting into hypnosis and meditation because it's kind of changing the pilot in a sense rather than trying tell me to... about hypnosis what's what's all that about what do you do how does it work what is it supposed to affect like so how, so how it... familiar are you familiar with meditation kind of yes like the, the idea behind meditation is kind of that you're getting in a very relaxed state and right. you can more easily access your subconscious as a result right and that's kind of the idea behind hypnosis as well is that it's just more i think there's more intent behind hypnosis it's more you're actively you're trying, trying to, to change into that that open mind yeah and the the key to hypnosis is getting into a deep state first and getting into a trance they call it which is essentially a meditative state there hypnosis and meditation are kind of the same thing actually i've realized but how do you affect yourself because every time i've i've been able to get into like one of my things that really helped me get to sleep is like um I would try to like meditate for a little bit and like my the form of meditation that I ended up trying to do is just trying to focus on something like a hum or like a like the blackness of my closed eyes mm -hmm. um and just like stop thinking and like these thoughts come in right and you just like no we're not doing that right now no yeah. and sometimes I would let them in depending on what I'm trying to do but like I could get in this trance where it's like I'm empty it was hard it's not always easy to do yeah. but i would get to that like empty spot but like how do you affect yourself when you're there mm -hmm. is that is that the same state that you're talking about or is it something different um it's similar i think cuz you're very relaxed in that state right and that's right. very central to hypnosis and it is I think it is easier when someone is hypnotizing you, assuming like you're right. trusting. I would them. imagine if I was in a blank state, I would be much more open to what anyone else has to say. But I don't know how I would affect myself. Yeah. What do you do? Is there a process to it? Yeah. Or... There's a there's a there's two things that I do. Like there's a guided one where it's basically them hypnotizing me, but through a recording. Uh, okay. But then there's also just a like step by step process that I was uh, shown how to do. Like the, he first went through it with me and now I am doing it on myself. And it's basically, I, I close my eyes. I do various like steps. I, um, I imagine that a balloon is like lifting my hand up. Um, and I, my hand naturally lifts up just cause I imagine it because the brain is powerful. Like I'm, I'm not actively trying to lift my hand up. So that kind of gives, gives you the self belief that it's like actually like, happening you know that you are hypnotizing yourself and that there is a balloon etc and then i walk down i imagine myself walking down steps and with each step i um uh, i repeat a mantra that i'm going deeper and deeper and deeper so step one i'm going deeper step one i'm going deeper and so on so i'm doing all these things just to get myself in a deep deep trance and before i do all this i have things in my mind that i want to change and I uh, basically have a conversation with myself about these things. Like, let's say I am, 
I, I don't like how I'm visualizing the future. I keep visualizing the future in a negative way because I'm a scared of being successful. So then I would go into this trance with this in mind that I want to realize that there is comfort and security in success and that I should want to be successful because being successful is, is security. That's safe. Um, cause another thing that I was told is that you shouldn't, you can't have negatives. Um, you can't be like, I don't want to be afraid. Then you'll just be afraid. Right. Like the, the subconscious for whatever reason doesn't respond to negatives. It only responds to you want to do this rather than I don't want to do this. Well, it's a lot more open-ended, right? Yeah. Not wanting is, is not that thing, but it's all the other things. Whereas like wanting is much more focused and central. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, but I, I've, I've only been recently been getting into it, so I'm not I'm no expert. <laughs> I have to try something like that. Are there guided like apps or stuff like that? Meditation uh, apps? I could look into it for you, but I, I haven't uh, gone through that because I, I, I went I discovered it in a very random way. Like I went to like a self-help seminar four days, like a traditional thing. And this hypnotist who I am now being taught by and had a meeting with today as well. Uh, he was a guest speaker there randomly. Like he was invited day of, and it was just a, like an extra added bonus, extra time for free. And he hypnotized me on stage <laughs> in front of everyone. And he hypnotized me to be confident. And following that, I, I acted way more confident. I felt way more confident. And honestly, I never, I never stopped feeling that like boost of confidence from that like very short, maybe like five minute hypnosis that he did on me. And I like almost immediately after that, I went home and I like got my first client on freelance game development. So like it had a profound impact on me from like this tiny thing. So like I, I followed him and uh, like now I'm doing the like coaching as well. Wow. Yeah, I never really took it seriously until I had a friend that told me something similar, except she had somebody that brought her on stage and made her act like a chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like. Normally, if anybody would have told me that, I'd be like, you're fucking lying. But yep. I trusted her. And I was like, so really, you thought you were a chicken? Really? Yeah. And then that made me look into the actual like medical benefits of it and the, the psyche and the subconscious. And I always like, assumed it was nonsense, too. Like it wasn't. Yeah. Like I thought it was just a show like paid actors, right? Yeah. Like when they do that stuff or whatever. But then I was like, oh, OK, that's interesting. And then now you're telling me this. Yeah, like it's I, th I think it's faster. super valuable because it's it's kind think, of directly influencing yourself in a way that, yeah, like a lot of other work wouldn't, you know. Well, if you think about like evolution and you think about you know we are these creatures that have evolved and we haven't evolved into the most perfect form. We've evolved series of like whatever survives, right? Yeah. And so if you think about it, there's probably a lot of holes in our physiology, like our tailbones and a lot of leftover like things and there's probably some loopholes in our psychology honestly i think loot boxes and gambling uh exploit loopholes in our psychology yep. for random rewards and stuff like that um probably one that has to do with hypnosis and and the things that we believe um i find that fascinating and i want to look more into that now lucid dreaming got me for a while too because i i, I read that like you could affect things in your waking life if you could control a lot of your dreams um i feel like I that's really an extreme that. version of visualization because you can like control what you're seeing in a big it way it was it actually it helped me over stage fright to be honest because a nice. lot of my lucid dreams i would go into like these large crowds and i would like talk to them yeah. um and it it helped quite a bit uh vi well just for straight up visualizing help but then the visualizing led to dreaming about it and dreaming about it led to lucid dreaming about it. So mm -hmm. I can't really tell what actually affected it, but um, yeah, but yeah, it's oftentimes it's doing many things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the change that I've managed to make is when I really surround myself with a singular uh, goal and all of the inputs happen to be around that thing. And all of the ex outputs happen to be around that thing. And all the, like the people and the YouTube videos and all the content I consume and everything yeah. is just, focused and it's, it's usually that focused change that can make results yeah um this year has been great for me in a like very weird way because the the way like 
what I described earlier, the way that I'm like dealing with COVID might sound awful to a lot of people, but I've, I think it's really good for the phase that I'm in because I've just been learning so much this year and I've had so yeah. many epiphanies and so many shifts in my mindset and I've accomplished a lot with my work as well. I just feel like it's been very good to focus and just get shit done and also like change my mind in a drastic way. Cause I've just immersed yeah. myself in like all these like self-help things and all these calls, all these people that I respect. And then on the other hand, yeah. immerse myself in action taking and work. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. Like it goes back to kind of what we started off with, right? It's like everybody needs different things. And I think there, there are people that socialize by default and there are people that isolate by default yeah. and the people that isolate by default probably need to socialize a little bit people that socialize by default they probably need to isolate a little bit right it can help their psyche yeah. and kind of come to terms with stuff and i think at the end of the day it comes down to a good balance and healthy activity of like understanding you and i think for me one of the reasons why i've gotten good at like youtube or talking or interacting um or sharing my thoughts or being honest about anything that i do online it has a lot to do with spending a lot of time alone um self-reflecting understanding myself understanding what makes me feel certain ways uh paying attention when i do something and i'm trying to understand why i do things but at the same time that that comes with disadvantages of like maybe i'm not the best in social situations maybe i you know don't have the skill sets in certain areas that i could have gained if i was doing other things but yeah like whatever you invest time in is what you improve at right like i've proactively exactly. spent a lot of time on socializing because that was something that i lacked with yeah but um yeah it's yeah, that's why I don't try I really don't give advice at all because is everybody needs something different and it really comes down to identifying the things that you want to improve and then really focusing on things you can control towards those things yeah I'm trying to get better about saying things specifically in the frame of this worked for me this is what I did etc yeah because I that's what that's I try to use that and then this would what I would do yeah uh, rather than like, do this I don't ever say that because at first I was excited. Like when I started YouTube, I was excited. Like, oh yeah, you should do this and this and this and this. Yeah, that's And then problem. I would start getting messages and then I did this and this is what happened. Like, oh fuck, wait, you did that? But you're in a, you're in that other situation. Oh shit, you're from a different country where that's like not acceptable. Like it's just oh, a thousand things <laughs> yeah. that I've never thought of, right? Like yeah. it was whoa, okay, so I gotta chill out on that. But also I realized that like I can be perfectly certain that something is the right thing to do. And I could be wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Like my the thing that I think made me do all of this other stuff could have just been random and completely unrelated to the result I got. Right? Yeah. So what I would do is the more accurate form of like because that's literally what I would do if I was in your scenario with my life and experience and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I had a pretty a fundamental part. thing shift in my like on Tuesday, I think it's Thursday now. I realized that my concept of love was like deeply flawed and toxic. Wow. Yeah. So I'm, I'm it's deep reframing now how I view love, which is like pretty, <laughs> that's like pretty fundamental. I feel like for people like our idea of what love is, is like that starts from a very young age and it's just always built on top. The tagline for phallophobia is love is hell. So <laughs> I'm with you on that one. <laughs> I had to do a lot of reframing coming from a, a demonic uh, force of, of what love was and what all this stuff is. Yeah. It was it was a hell of a lot of reframing because that game really painted painted it as a dark, deep thing that was horrific. The, the messed um, up thing for me like, was um, I viewed, like for me, love was actually, like I liked the like negative. I liked the like toxic relationship yeah. almost in a in like wrong way. Like it wasn't that I viewed love as like a bad thing. It was yeah. that what I thought of as love was toxic. Cause like the, right. so I was naturally in a frame where I couldn't really have a healthy relationship where there's just love. Yeah. Cause I, for me, like the, like a lot of neediness, a lot of like just attachment that was love like just where you need each other and like you're two halves and you're just complete each other. Like, which I thought that wasn't me, but I I've realized that like, that is kind of what I was seeing as love. Yeah. And that can do a lot of things that can, that can one, it can force your vision of what it is into the actual uh, relationship. Right. So like it can, it can literally cause problems by you trying to enact 
like the reality of what you want it to be into it and it can cause issues yeah. but also like it can kind of prevent a lot of growth right like rather than have this um perspective where like anything can change or grow or can be all of these things like by thinking it's this thing yeah. right it can make you miss opportunities it can make you hurt people it can make you you know change things that shouldn't be changed it can do all kinds of stuff yeah um i had a lot of soul searching phobia so it was yeah. like why am i making a game this horrific about <laughs> something that people think is beautiful um it was it was an interesting process yeah it's good it's good as you recognize that though it's something that i think a lot of our entertainment honestly has this like false conception of what it is yeah right i definitely like, got a lot of it from that from all the entertainment i idolized yeah yeah it's the more that i think about it the more that i learn in life the more i realize that like like everything it's very fluid right it's very it can be a lot of things to a lot of people and different people need different things and uh if you're you've heard of the love languages right the five love languages yeah, yeah i have that was the most effective tool that i've ever used because it made me really identify like how i give and receive love and that made me really think about like it's almost like a, a ux design on your personal relationships right yeah. if you can kind of like put people through that in your head and say okay not, not even like like you know um intimate relationships but just like friends family that yeah. kind of thing you'd be like okay well this person you know they like to give things uh and gifts they don't really like to spend time with people they don't really like to have deep conversations but they'll spend their money which they don't have much of on people right like that's how they do it and when you start to identify that thing and you can say okay rather than not like oh they they don't really like me because they don't like give me love my way right mm -hmm. they give you love their way and if you can understand that it can give you a lot more empathy and understanding of like how the interpersonal relationships work and it's really made me understand a lot more about me uh because like i just went through a birthday too we were talking about birthday and like i've always had a thing of like as a kid i, I felt like i wasn't really cared about like yeah. i had a thing like like my parents you know they were busy they were doing a bunch of shit but like a lot of times when i came to my birthday in the middle of christmas season like they would forget to get a cake or they would just pick me up a present from CVS or stuff. And, and like that stuff didn't matter really, but it was like the thought that I was an afterthought mm -hmm. made me feel horrible. Right. Yeah. Like I didn't give a fuck what I, I didn't give a fuck about the cake. The cake was fucking good. Yeah, but the fact the that thought. you picked it up yeah. at the PM, right. Like at a, at a convenience store or whatever that made me feel like shit. Uh, and I, I basically realized that that became my narrative. <laughs> Um, similar to what you were talking about earlier of like, that's what I was looking for. That's what I, that's what I had decided that my birthday was. And so I was looking for proof of how people don't give a fuck about me. Yeah. Or and that's, what's so that. dangerous. Cause you're, you're literally looking for something negative essentially. Yeah. I, and I was, it was yeah. crazy. And, and that, the craziest was, yeah. thing happened, uh, my wonderful girlfriend, Alyssa, she, uh, worked with some of the moderators in GDU and she had uh, lots of people sign a GDU card, which I saw your signature on there. Yeah. Uh, and looking at looking at dozens of people from all across the world sign a card. It actually brought me to tears. That's awesome. Because it was like the exact opposite of a belief that I've held for a very long time, and it was it meant a lot to me. The That's people cool. from all around the globe actually gave a fuck. It was nice. Yeah. I, I can't speak for everyone, but yeah, I give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, it's one of those things that like, it's not reality. It's, it's this warped version of reality with the lenses that you have on. I right? would go even more extreme. I would say we create our reality. Like we are creating the reality. Right. Right. If I could have reframed that same stuff that happened with my parents of like, as busy as my fucking parents were, all the craziness that went down, they still stopped and they got me a kick. They yep. still thought about me and they got me something, right? That same thing is is the same event. It's the same, like, shit that happened. It's just framed differently. Yeah, and totally the meaning, and it goes experience. back to Tony Robbins stuff, is like, it's not about the thing, it's about what you make the thing mean. Yeah, we're meaning it, machines, I feel like. We, we, really we, are. we assign meaning line. to everything. <laughs> so yeah. what meaning we assign is very important. Yeah. It really, really is. And it, it that meaning drives you 
a lot. It's why a lot of people I think are unfulfilled in their lives and stuff is because of the meaning that they've given is 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 boring and outdated and it doesn't resonate with them, right? Whereas like my whole game dev journey has been about the meaning of creating and and sharing with people and and yeah. putting my soul into something that I share with other people. And giving wanting to give is so powerful. Right. Like that that's a big driver. That's also why I want to kind of inject basically stuff that I'm learning or have learned into the games I make in some way, even if it's not in a direct way, because I just want to give back. And I don't feel like my best way to give back is through like teaching or preaching, you know, because I've never really resonated with that. But I've, yeah, I've always enjoyed video games and movies and I've been deeply impacted by them. So I kind of want to do similar, but with different concepts. Right. And I think I think it's powerful, too, because it's like self-improvement and all that stuff like you have to actively seek that stuff out to find it. But entertainment is is a common part of all of our all of our lives. And, and like if you can put your art into a form of entertainment, you can get through to people that otherwise would never have found you or seek yep. you out right, to learn from you. Um, and I think that makes it a really powerful medium that we have to respect because of it. Yeah. And I think that's a great note to end on. I think uh, my grandma's calling me. <laughs> so, you, gotta, you gotta talk to grandma. It's your birthday. You don't ignore grandma's call on birthday. Okay, I learned that lesson. <laughs> oh no, what happened? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's All been right. great talking, Tim. Um, it's been nice. Talk. We always have great chats. This is yeah. fantastic. Life, philosophy, hypnotism, game dev, and our thoughts on love. Yes. Everyone, thank you for listening. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs> so bye. All right. Bye-bye. Recording.